You're watching the New Stack Makers, a podcast for people who develop, deploy, and manage at scale software. For more information and articles about at scale technologies, please visit thenewstack.io. Now enjoy the show. So I'm with Dr. Hakeem Hasid. Hakeem is with is the chief researcher at the Technology Innovation Institute AI Cross Center Unit out of Abu Dhabi. That's correct? From the Technology Innovation Institute from Abu Dhabi, indeed. Okay, great. And you are the group behind Falcon. Correct. I love the name Falcon. I love Falcons. I love hawks and birds of prey. Wonderful. And... You know, the Falcon has a deep symbolism, I guess, in, in, uh, in Abu Dhabi, I believe, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So the Falcon is actually the national bird of uh, the UAE, and it actually symbolizes the courage and the perseverance in life. That's really neat. Yeah. The courage and perseverance in life. In life, correct. And so the courage and perseverance in life applies how to your group? The, the technology research group? Well, the Technology Innovation Institute is actually a very young institution. It has been created four years back. Uh, it has been launched around 2020. Uh, and the symbols here is that we need to have courage to undertake challenges. So in terms of AI, for example, so far the only groups who are taking the lead are big groups who have been in the business for more than 20 years. And the perseverance is that we are pushing forward uh, with the challenges that we are facing every day. We are pushing things forward. We are not giving up and we are uh, getting interesting outcomes at the end of the day. I love that. I really love that approach. It really speaks to, um, in the United States, I grew up with the term that I don't think really applies to you, but I think generally it applies to uh, perseverance and courage. And that's the one who is always fighting, is always there to kind of like, you know, it doesn't matter who their opponent is. And we use the term underdog to some extent, right? Interesting. But it's, it's a different term, but I think it's a different... It's the same. Yeah, it's, a diff yeah, there's a, it's like, you know... I don't care how big you are. Absolutely. I don't care like how big a force you have, right? Absolutely. I don't care how many years experience you have. Absolutely. And and so here we are. And so now with Falcon, how did Falcon Falcon originate? I want I'm curious on the on the story behind it. Yeah, so back in 2022 actually the AI research center has been started uh, and it was actually it started exploring the traditional AI, I would say. But then there was this, uh, this challenge around building a better artificial intelligence. So this is where the team started looking into how to build a model that would use deep neural networks and transformers mainly, bring the compute that was actually the main recipe behind the modern AI. Uh, since we have enough compute, we said, let's, let's build it. Let's combine all this power together to get something. So, uh, we started actually building a small Arabic model uh, okay. initially, that was the Noor. Uh, after Noor, we said, okay, I think we can take it to a larger scale. I so see. This, this is where Falcon started uh, getting to life. We started with Falcon 7B, that was a small model right. uh, on that. The performance were a little bit uh, not as of today's uh, models, but then we built a, a bigger model that was the 40B. Uh, that was actually an interesting model because the architecture was interesting. The scale at which it was, it was trained was also interesting. The evaluations put it in the top of the leaderboards for a few weeks on, on Hugging Face, for yeah. example. Four months later, we have built a, a second model that was much bigger, the 180, the Falcon 180B, that comes with 180 billion parameters and was trained on 3.5 trillion token at the time. And again, for a, for a second time, it topped the, uh, the, the leaderboards, the different leaderboards for the open source uh, LLMs. So the, sto the story started there, and now we are going further. And the challenge, I would say, is not to go necessarily big, 
but to go small with more efficiency and more quality. And this is the path that we are taking well, nowadays. But why an LLM? Why, why did you decide to do that? Well, I think you have different reasons uh, behind that, right? So the first reason is that it's a scientific challenge, right? So there are a lot of challenges in terms of science to understand, to unlock the knowledge behind that. Uh, that's an important thing. The second thing is that all the countries, most of the countries, I would say, are trying to build something around LLM, around AI. Understanding better AI today will give you more sovereignty and eventually more uh, sort of control on your destiny at the end of the day. So it's extremely important also for the government of the UAE to have such tools, such, such understanding, such knowledge within the country to be able to exist in, in, in the world. Fascinating to think of it as an issue of sovereignty. You know, that must have been part of the original premise behind it then. Yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, as I said again, most of the countries nowadays are trying to build this, this, this AI to have some sovereign tools that will allow it to be independent, to be in charge of its destiny at the end of the day. Yeah, and some of these are corporations are rival nation states in their, in their compute capabilities and their you know, and the actual kind of like influence and power that they have. Absolutely, but one of the things that is making the situation a little bit weird nowadays between governments and big corporations is that we do not have enough understanding of AI and the capabilities, how we can control AI, what is the impact of AI on, on the society, on the economy, on the security of the, of, of the nations. This is why everybody is taking it more from a, a fear perspective rather than being more courage. open. Absolutely. Right. So, so you take an open source approach. Tell us a little bit about that and, what, and why you believe in it. Well, the open source, uh, the first thing actually is that you have a community behind uh, whatever technology you are trying to put in place. And that's why we are here today uh, with the uh, open source uh, summit. You have a community that will be looking into what is happening inside the AI. That is extremely important. This is actually enables transparency. So transparency is something important and we need to reach to a point where we have a better understanding, where we have a better perspective on what's happening in the AI. Nobody wants to have an AI in, in his company and then gets spying the employees, for example, or getting information that is leaked outside, right? So this is one thing. The community is, is one thing. Transparency is, is, is something else. And then you have the efficiency. At the end of the day, having several people working on the technology, it's having more people basically putting efforts into improving it and taking it to the next to the next level. So tell us how you trained it. What did you do? What was your approach to training the model? Because there's a distinction between other LLMs, such as OpenAI and, and the approach that you took. Yeah, so I think the, the difference would be, I would say, in, in the data, right? So the, we have used transformers, of course, and we have used GPUs for the training, uh, different sort of uh, amounts of GPUs, depending on the size. Uh, when we take the 180B, for example, we have used 4,000 GPUs to, to A100 A to, to train it. But I think the difference uh, comes from the data, the quality of the data. So we have set up uh, specific pipelines for cleaning the data, for making sure that the data will be injecting inside the LLM will be clean enough to get some interesting results. So uh, once you get the compute, you get the transformer or the, or, or the neural networks and the clean data, combining these three items gives you an interesting model with very high quality uh, of results. Why did, you, why did you take that approach? What, what, what drew you to that kind of that thinking? When you were, when you were looking at the, you know, the, the different types of LLMs in the market? What, I think, again, like you don't have a lot of sort of uh, options when it comes to training the LLMs, right? right? So you have the transformer that is an important backbone. The difference doesn't come in the transformer. So transformer, you can optimize it to use, for example, less compute to make the training faster, for example. But what makes the difference at the end of the day is the quality of the data that you are giving as an input for your model. If the quality is bad, the output, the model at the end of the day will be extremely bad, right? 
as I understand, you developed a pipeline, you know, and code base that's that's unique in itself. How would you how would you describe that that data pipeline and code base? Yeah, so the data pipeline actually we have uh, used different levels of clean. So instead of just looking at, for example, the duplication, so we have reinforced the duplication, right? So this is one thing. So we have looked actually into the more original content to 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 include inside the uh, uh, inside the LLM. So we have put different levels. So from the let's say if you have 100% of initial data, your data set that you use uh, to clean, we ended up with about 10% of the data that we have used. So we have used the pipeline that is extremely strict to make sure that we only accept content that is bringing value at the end of the day to the uh, to the model. At the end of the of the um, the pipeline, we have always to build a smaller model to check if the data quality that we are getting at the end is more interesting than the previous layers. So you're really looking for high quality data. Absolutely. And so, how, so what approaches are you taking to find that high quality data? Th- that's the different layers that uh, we are. The different layers. Different layers. Actually. What are some of the layers that? Are, one of the one of the layers, as I said, is the duplication. The, okay, that one. Okay. That that one is one one of the layers, and then you need to look at the structure of the content. You want, for example, statements or sentences, paragraphs that are well formed. For example, you don't want to cut paragraphs or sentences in the middle, right? So you have the punctuation that you need to follow, for example. So you have all this structure structural information that you need to respect. And you need to evaluate on the content before sending it to the to the training. What what about open data then? And how do you think about attribution matters in your LLM? Well, open data in terms of uh, being the, the the you know, there's a lot of data that's now being licensed, absolutely. right? And uh, there's also data um, that is just pulled from the web, you know. From different websites, and so there's an attribution matter there. Yeah, I think that's 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 an issue that we are. Uh, I think I think everybody is struggling a little bit with it. The data that we are using for our, all our trainings is coming from the web, so we consider it as a public data. So, but there is indeed some an increasing, I would say, voice around the copyright. Copyright, right? So that's that that, that is that is coming indeed, and we need to pay attention for that. So we have some manual sort of uh, processing but the issue that we will have and everybody has nowadays is that you are handling a huge amount of data so how can you actually make sure that this can be done or your processes can scale to this kind of uh, of data so there are things that are easy to exclude when we identify automatically the copyright but there are other things that for which we need more uh, more work and i think having a community that works together is one of the solutions that will help uh, into making these things much cleaner. I'd like to get into the com- community a bit. Maybe we can end with that. But you know, one of the things that I've been reading about your, your model is how you optimize your efficiency and performance. What are you doing in the architecture itself to help optimize for efficiency and performance? So the efficiency and the performance, you have it at two, at two levels, right? You have at the training level and you have at the inference level, yeah. right? So when it comes to the training level, we are making sure that we are integrating the, la- the latest technologies like instead of using flash attention, we are using flash attention too because it is much more uh, efficient. It uses less, uh, it uses less memory, for example. Uh, when it comes to the uh, inference side, we are using techniques like quantization. So we are making the models smaller. Uh, we are removing... Uh, some layers also in the model to make it much faster and to consume less resources when it when you do the the inference and we can also do some optimizations we are uh, exploring optimization at the hardware level uh, using specific chips for example to make sure that we are increasing the, uh, are those your own home build tools are those monitoring tools are those observability tools what are these uh, th- these are home home uh, build tools except on the hardware side we are using things that exist we are not building hardware, we are consuming the hardware. Yeah. But when it comes to the uh, quantization, for example, we are using our own uh, techniques for quantization uh, that are built from on, 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 on site on ours. What are you learning about monitoring and observability and bug fixing through your process? Because it's all semantics in, you know, in these large language models. Yeah, absolutely. I think we, we still need to learn a lot from that, from that perspective when it comes to 
monitoring the models and these kind of things. We are doing a lot of manual uh, tasks when it comes to that, and it goes to the back to the expertise of the people who are working there. Automating all these processes takes time. We have our own tools, but we don't have a specific standardized tool on that. But we are working definitely on transforming or capturing that experience into tools that will offer some automation at the end of the of the book. Are those open source tools that you're developing? The objective is to make them open source definitely. Okay. Yeah. Well, like what kind of tools? You mentioned some of the tools already. Yeah, so are there any other additional ones that are interesting? We are building this, this quantization again. That's yeah. a very important part of uh, what yeah. we are doing. Monitoring the cluster, for example, okay. to, make, to see what's going on inside the cluster. Are we using the whole cluster for the full capacity? Uh, identifying nodes that are, uh, I would say, lazy uh -huh. uh, when it comes to the infrastructure. So all these tools, we will be at some point pushing them to the open source community. Do you use the Kubernetes platform? We don't use the Kubernetes for the moment, at least for the trainings that we have done. We don't use it yet, but uh, on the uh, local cluster, the on-site, uh, on-premise on local cluster that we have, we are using that. But that cluster, we use it more for experimentation, for experimentation. rather than... Uh, so to scale, scale it out, trip. you're basically using VMs on just lots, lots of uh, computer On the cloud, yeah, yeah, on, on the, the cloud, cloud. definitely. Do you use your own cloud or you use a... Uh, no, we use the uh, AWS. You use AWS. Cloud, okay. yeah, definitely. Now, I'm interested also, interested also in your, how you're reducing the compute requirements. And I'm trying to like understand why you're doing that. And I expect that there's lots of people all over the world who don't have great connectivity, for example. Yeah. Is that a reason why? This is one of the reasons, in, in, indeed. So uh, when you go into this efficiency, this compute, at the end of the day, not everyone can afford sophisticated machines and hardware to, to run these models. Uh, if we see, for example, you have countries where the only thing they have are small devices equipped with CPUs at the end of the day. So it's extremely important to get that. But then you have also the, the, the bill that comes at the end of the day uh, from using these models. The electrical like uh, consumption, the budget that you put inside inside all this uh, this process. So we're trying to make sure that the compute that we use is reduced to reduce the the, the energetic energetic bill at the end of the day. So the last question I'm going to ask about community, but I'm going to put it in con in a little bit of context because sure. when I was doing a little bit of my research, I you know one thing that I learned about was that you have the ability to really interact in a conversational manner. For example, that you have uh, the ability to do this dynamic exchange uh, back and forth yep. uh, questioning um, and answering follow and answering follow questions like something I might see in like perplexity, for example, right? And you know, you also are really trying to be like a modern LLM, like there's a human-like interactions, the chatbots, the virtual assistants, those types of things. So. Like, if you could pick your community, who would it be? Like, would you, like who are the people that are they're building these types of tools? Are those the people that you're looking for? Or what, what kind of skill sets do you really need to help to help, help the, the, the LLM, you know, reach that next level? I think it, the, to build these LLMs, you need the multidisciplinary people, right? So you have people who will be, who need to be good on the machine learning side, the AI side. You have people who need to be good on the operating system side. You have people who need to be good also on the human interaction side. So the examples you have listed are, I, I see them as more on the fine-tuning side, right. because it is one action that is more on the chat, right? Right. So getting some data and then you, yes. you have to specialize the behavior of, uh, of your model for a specific thing. I think to get to a point where these models are rich enough, we need to integrate multidisciplinary people. So people who are coming, as I said, operating systems, human computer interaction, uh, machine learning people, different, different uh, sort of uh, perspectives. And the message that I, I, I have a talk tomorrow and the message that I wanted to share is that, you know, you don't have the open source AI community and the open source systems community, but these two communities, they have to work together first because we we can get a lot from the experience that this uh, open source systems community has gained since 30 years plus. And the second is that the AI is just a new thing that is coming 
around. So there is, there is definitely a way to contribute to that. Okay, I have another question. Sure. Uh, one of the uh, aspects of any software development is trade-offs. Yeah. And lots of young companies that are building out AI technologies have to think about trade-offs all the time. Absolutely. A lot of trade-offs are kind of based upon who's in your community, for example, right? Other trade-offs in particular might be about what do you deploy, right? So like my question is like, what is your approach to making these types of decisions? Do you think about deploying models first and always first and then pushing them into, you know, you know, into review and then out onto the infrastructure itself? Or do you, or like, how are you balancing that with features, for example, that you're developing and such? Yeah. Like classic kind of questions that relate to software development. Sure. So on, on our level, actually, what we are doing is to build the core model, right? So the downstream tasks, they need to be built by either the community or people who have a sort of a commercial interest behind that. So we sort of limit our contribution to the, the difficult part of the LLMs, that is building the model itself. So, and then we release that model and up to the community, to the users to take it further by doing fine tuning, deploying it somewhere else, or uh, even like continue the training if, if, if they want. Because the blocking point for democratizing these LLMs is actually having the capability to build an LLM. It is extremely costly, so you cannot have anyone who can build it. So what we are doing is opening the path for yeah. people, solving the biggest problem, and then supporting the people down the road to do some more uh, uh, updates, more uh, improvements of the model that we build. So what's next for Falcon? Well, you have different actually things that we are working on. One of them is the multimodality. So Falcon so far is a text-based model. So we're integrating the multimodality, the images, the videos uh, inside. Uh, the second thing is around the mixtures of experts. We hear about it all the time these days. Uh, Falcon will be uh, becoming soon uh, a mixture of expert model. And then we have the, uh, I would say, the, the core issues that we do not, when I say we as a community, we don't fully understand yet is the safety and the bias inside these models. We are working hard to understand and to make sure that these models are safe and we reduce at least the bias that is uh, integrated and inherently for comes from the data actually at the end of the day. Well, thank you very much, Hakeem. I really appreciate your time. My pleasure. Thank you very much for your time. If you like this video, please give us a thumbs up. And if you'd like to see more videos like this, you can always subscribe to our YouTube channel. We're on all the major social media platforms. You can always find us at thenewstack.io. We hope to see you soon.